uh, Carter Bray, it's quite an honor to be sitting next to you and have a chance to talk to you about uh, your amazing tenure as principal cellist of the New York Phil. It's my honor to be here next yeah. to you, Paul. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I know as a teacher, one of my biggest responsibilities is helping uh, my students, particularly my graduating students, preparing for their uh, first professional audition, or in sometimes their sixth or their seventh. <laughs> yes, uh, I know all the words to that song. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it would be wonderful for those of us that teach to just for you to talk a little bit about what you're listening for, uh, what if you have any suggestions uh, as to how we can help. Sure young people prepare. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say the first thing that comes to my mind is the frequency with which students ask me how, how they should be expected to play. Should they be expected to play in a certain way? Should they tow a certain stylistic line? Mm -hmm. What is the committee expecting to hear? And I always throw it back at them and I say, listen, I've sat on a hundred audition committees, not just cello audition committees, but for flute, for French horn, for, for timpani, which was wow. an interesting topic for another day. <laughs> um, and I would say, without exception, what everybody on all of those committee, committees wanted to hear was a committed, convincing musician on the other side of the screen, full stop. That's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear somebody who is trying to fulfill some imaginary expectation. Mm. There's no model. There's no mm. model except for good musicianship and stylistic awareness and, of course, technical competence. That goes without saying. Um, that's your beginning point. But what we really are dying to hear back there is someone who, a mature musician who comes and has a good musical point of view and can put it across convincingly. That's what we want to hear. So what we often hear is that not too much personality. It's okay for the principal to have personality, but you got to fit in the section. So is there some truth to that? Uh, is that's what I'm, I'm trying to say, actually, no. No, that's, yes. No, yeah. I think that's a mistake, because we don't want to hear cookie cutters. The, the re there's a reason for that. Yeah. If someone is in my section rotation, I need for them the orchestra needs for them to have a highly developed sense of awareness so that if conductor X, Y, or Z gets up and uh, in contrast to what somebody previously has said wants something completely different in some given passage, they can turn on a dime. Not just that, so that they'll understand the ramifications about that musical suggestion or request. Um, so that I don't have to turn around and explain it a second time. If they're a highly sophisticated musical thinker, they'll understand it immediately and be able to adapt. I imagine with all of the many people you have on the podium that you need people that are flexible. That's, yeah. that's our reality. Yes. Um, there is not one way that we're going to be playing things. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's artistically unsatisfying and a waste of time if everybody goes on autopilot playing something the way Zubin Mehta did it in 1988. It's, it's, that was one thing and today is today's thing. So they have to be very flexible and in order to be flexible they have to be smart, they have to be competent, and they have to be extremely well trained. That well, goes also for their ability to be able to furnish a, a good flexible accompaniment for orchestral soloists. If there's an eight-bar flute solo or something like that, they, mm -hmm. uh, I want to know that they are uh, experienced enough as chamber music players to give him time to breathe at the end of bar four, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, I tell my students, uh, okay, you want an orchestral career, but play chamber music while you're in school because it teaches you to listen to others. Exactly. Uh, in yes. fact, I would say every kind of live music there is, it's classical, jazz, rock, country, western, if it's live, it's all about listening. Mm -hmm. If you're not listening, you're not welcome. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Sure. 
Well, I was witness, uh, you know, when you and four of your section colleagues from uh, the New York Phil uh, played that uh, cello bello concert for us last December, and it was four or five of you playing cello ensembles. I mean, it was so clear that everybody was such a good musician. Oh, yes. Of course they were wonderful cellists too, but yeah. everybody was a musical person, everybody. Right. Uh, and so fair. Somebody you wanted to listen to. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. each one of them had such a different cellistic personality. Yeah. And that illustrates what I'm talking about. Do you find that uh, people tend to freeze a lot in auditions because they're overly conscious of technical of course. Yes. Yeah. I, I think playing an orchestral audition is it's just the worst thing imaginable. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, just, I can't worse. imagine anything worse. No, there isn't. Take it from me. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing that went through my head when I got the phone call telling me I got the job was, oh good, no more auditions. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's, yeah. it's inhuman. Yeah. It's unmusical. It's unhuman. It's just the worst. Yeah. You're expected to get up and within the space of 10 minutes maximum, in your first round to prove that you can get around on the instrument and that you can follow instructions and start at letter C instead of start at the beginning of something and make sense out of it. Mm. So it's very difficult. So when you, uh, you have a group of cellists coming for a, an audition, do you send out section bowings and fingerings or do you are you interested in what people have figured out on their own? We, we generally let them do what they want to do. Uh -huh. um, there'll be ample time if they win the job to get used to our Boeings. Uh, but that's not terribly important to us. I see. And I think that's consistent with what I was just, with what I was just saying. It's, uh, it's not important that they sound like us initially. We just want to hear that there's someone with enough awareness that you can be confident that they'll be able to blend in the right way. Okay. And I don't know if you can been in the business enough years, you might be able to comment on this. When you look, let's say, 15, 20 orchestras around the United States, would you say that the values are pretty much the same everywhere? What you just told me, you think that applies? I have to assume it does. I haven't really spoken to my uh, principal colleagues in, in exactly those terms, but to judge from what I hear, I would say yes. Yeah, great. Which is good. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing. They're the values I believe in. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. And those are the values, you know, we both promulgate in our teaching and hopefully uh, uh, when people go out into the wide world, they'll carry those with them, whether it's as an orchestral player, or as a chamber music player, a soloist, or a teacher. Maybe a couple of uh, uh, just technical questions, for example. Uh, what about a person with a really florid vibrato? Might that be a problem? Yes. Yes. So, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Now that, <laughs> now that, that could be a great player. Of but, course. Yes. Now yeah. that I've stuck my neck out yeah. saying that we want to hear highly interesting musicians, yeah. of course there are parameters here and here. Yes. Call it a batter's box. Uh -huh. uh, there's a lot of latitude in there, but uh, if we hear someone who comes in with a, a sort of Daniel Schaffron kind of vibrato, <laughs> people are going to say, well, we love this person's playing, I might find that a problem sitting next to them, uh, trying to create a fine blend with that. And what would you say about Glissandos? Um, I like them a lot. <laughs> 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 and uh, it's like when so somebody has to tell everybody if you're auditioning for Carter, make sure you slide a lot. Slide a lot. Don't yes. vibrate. Yeah. It's, it's like when somebody asked <laughs> Calvin Coolidge how he he came out of church one time, and uh, someone asked him about the sermon, and uh, he said, "Oh, it was about sin." And the reporter said, "Really? What did what did the preacher say about it?" He said. He was again it. <laughs> so I'm all for slides, of course. Um, it, this, it's, it's a very tricky thing for an entire section of 12 cellists to yes, do course. that in the right way. It, again, it depends on listening. Um, very often they'll take their cue from me uh, or the conductor. Um, but I think to create a really interesting lyrical line, uh, 
course, it's an essential thing. It's an essential element of string playing. And uh, uh, when it's directed the right way, it's a beautiful thing. Something subtle, not too thick. <laughs> I feel like there's another stanza coming in here that rhymes. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, again, that you know that fits in, in the uh, under the rubric of stylistic awareness. Sure. Of course. Can you think of any other no-nos? Uh, jumping rhythm, in rhythm. Tell me well, about rhythm. Yes, rhythm like, has to be. See a dotted eighth in the sixteenth. Let's say, uh, is there a freedom there? Uh, that depends. Uh -huh. If you're playing the Mahler fifth. Da, 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 you want to hear a bit of over dotting there. If you're playing some Beethoven, perhaps not so much, or maybe so, you know, maybe. It makes musical sense. Yeah. I mean, it's something like the slow move of the Fourth Symphony. Bum, 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 bum. That has to be exact. Of course, yes, yeah. So uh, we want to hear someone with perfect rhythm who is so comfortable with their perfect rhythm that they, they don't mind being asked to step outside of that. Oh, that's beautifully put. Yeah. Yeah. Good.